Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends. I'm here with my friend Stan Ford, and Stan and I are continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark. Today, <laughs> today we're going to talk about something very specific, how to be ready for the end times. Jesus is going to teach. This is the last teaching of, of Teaching Tuesday, and he's going to be talking hmm. about how to be ready for the end times. He's going to give some warnings, some commands, and we're going to get to that when we come right back. So hi, and welcome back to Bible Study with Friends. As I said, we're in the book of Mark. We're going to start in chapter 13. We're going to finish chapter 13 today. We're going to talk about uh, Jesus' teaching. In fact, the last thing he teaches on Teaching Tuesday. We've, we've been on Tuesday for quite a while, Stan. Yeah. And, uh, two or three chapters, I think. And, and yeah. we're going to start in, in chapter 14. Wednesday starts. But this has been Tuesday. And all the teaching that he's done in Tuesday, he's, he's confronted the, the scribes and Pharisees. He's taught about end times. He's already started yeah. to talk about end times. And now he's going to finish that up. And then he's going to uh, rest a little bit on Wednesday, and then we'll see uh, the, the last Passion Days of, of Thursday, uh, Friday, and Saturday, and Resurrection Sunday. And we'll be finished with the Book of Mark. Let's do a little background first of all. We're, we're going to be in the section of chapter 13, starting at verse 14. Actually, we're going to back up to verse 13 in a second here, but... Uh, we're going to go very quickly through these verses. Now, one of the reasons for this is Jesus is not trying to teach an exhaustive teaching about end time. What Jesus is yeah. basically doing is, is reassuring the audience, reassuring believers that God has got a plan and it's going to work out. And they are not going to be taken by surprise if they do some certain things. And really, the teaching is really general not specific and yeah. we, we shouldn't be looking into it for specific details that jesus is going to exhaust uh the, the teaching he talks much more detailed in other areas but uh today we're going to be talking about this how to be ready for the end times and that's all jesus is trying to do trying to give us here now i do want to mention that i have i have four videos one of the reasons why we're not going to go real slow through every verse is i have four videos that we've already done on bible study with friends uh under the playlist systematic theology and what i'm going to do is in the description below i'm going to put four links uh i have i have a playlist for uh the millennial kingdom a playlist for the rapture a playlist for uh the the judgment, and then a playlist for the new heaven and the new earth, and the basically the reboot of the system. And I have mm -hmm. I have those in great detail, and a lot of verses. Um, I get we do get into very specifics in those in those teachings. I also have a free workbook that when you go to those videos, as a link, you can get a free workbook. Uh, that really goes into it has all the verses uh, for you there and uh, it gives you a lot of information and that's absolutely free so if you're interested in more details more details than jesus is going to give in in chapter 13 yeah look at the description below and look for those four links i'll put them right at the top so you uh, you see those okay Sounds okay. good. All right. Well, let's start. Let's get into our scripture. Now, we're going to start at verse, actually, verse 13. We talked about this at the end of last week, where he's he's basically been teaching in chapter 13 on the coming judgment of God in the end times. He talked about Jerusalem and the, the attack on Jerusalem and that it was going to be destroyed. And then he is going to talk about this. But there's a transition verse. Verse 13 says, you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, and there's where we see that word, the end, right? Yeah. He will be saved. Yeah. Now, Jesus is now going to launch into 
how do you endure? And how can we get some details on what to be aware of about the end times? Look at verse 14. It's kind of interesting from a perspective of the reader. Verse 14 says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, and then there's this little parenthesis, let the reader understand. Yeah. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, the average Gentile, we've talked about this, that Mark is written for the Gentile, and there's very little Jewish background, there's very little Jewish uh, prophecy in it. It's, it's more about who Jesus is and what he's like as, a, as an action hero, really. The Messiah as a man of action, as a God who is there to serve. That's really what this is about. But this verse is interesting. Now, if you just read verse 14 right on the surface of it, do you know what the abomination of desolation is? Not just reading that verse, no. Okay. No. And it says, let the reader understand. Well, a Gentile reader in Rome that's trying to learn about Jesus, he is not going to understand because there's no quotes, there's no nothing. It's just the title, abomination of desolation. And you yeah. go, well, Jesus is kind of leaving that vague. Well, there's going to be a lot of vague teaching here because all he's trying to do is give you a principle. And yeah. there's a hint on who he's talking to in verse 14, that he's not talking to the Gentile reader. He's talking to the, the readers who are in Judea. Judea. Jewish readers? Jewish readers. Yeah. And he says, hey, listen, when you see the abomination of desolation, where it shouldn't be, every every Jew in Judea needs to, to run. Get out of Jerusalem. If, yeah. If we want to do some background, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, Stan, but if we wanted to do some background, what is the abomination of desolation? Uh, it, it's an interesting study. If you go back to, Je to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and to chapter 11, verse 31, and chapter 12, verse 11. In fact, in chapter 11, 31, and chapter 12, verse 11, Daniel uses that exact expression of the abomination of desolation. Yeah. And you can read those verses. Uh, it, it, it's, it's clear that it's talking about the end times. Let me explain very quickly what that is. In, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies was where God's presence was, and that was the holy spot for the Jews. What would happen is there's going to be three times in history that somebody, a Gentile, breaks into that Holy of Holies and yeah. offers a pig in sacrifice to a pagan god. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to be this, des this, uh, this abomination of desolation. It's, a, it's des desolating the Holy of Holies that God has had in his temple. Now, that happens three times in history. The first time it happens is to fulfill Daniel. It happens in 167 B.C., before Christ. Uh, a Syrian named Antiochus Epiphanes, and it, it, it's, his name is right over here in our notes. He goes into the Holy of Holies, and he erects a uh, an altar to Zeus, and he slaughters a pig. Now, of course, pigs are unclean animals to the Jews, so he slaughters yeah. a pig, and that's that's the first time it happens. But it's going to happen again. In fact, in 70 AD, when in in the future, when Jesus is talking here, remember he's just talked about Jerusalem is going to be de devastated, it's, it's and it's going to be destroyed. destroyed. When that happens in 70 AD, in just a few years after Jesus, about 30 years after Jesus is talking here, it happens again. The Roman general goes in and he offers a pig, uh, just a, just kind of a thumb in the eye of the Jews. Yeah. It's going to happen one more time, and that is when the Antichrist, three and a half years into the seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist walks into the temple, and he declares himself to be God, standing in the temple, and desolates the Holy of Holies. And that's the third time this is fulfilled of the Holy of Holies is violated in Jerusalem. Now, to a Gentile, that, that all doesn't make sense other than yeah. there's going to be an event. And the event is going to be very meaningful to the people who are in Judea, people who are down around the Jerusalem area. And he says, mm -hmm. when they see this happening in Jerusalem, it's time to get out of town. Now, it would have been Time to get out of town in 167. 
uh, BC because Jerusalem was going to get destroyed. And here again in 70 AD, it's a good time to be out of town because yeah. it's going to get destroyed. And in, when the Antichrist is coming, if they're still alive when the Antichrist comes and declares himself to be God, that's when the other three and a half years of the tribulation just it's going to be bad. All hell breaks loose on earth and God judges yeah. the earth. And it's a good time to, to be gone. It's a good time to run. In fact, it goes on here. And, and let me just read quickly. Verse 15. This is down in Judea now. Yeah. One who is on his housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out mm -hmm. of his house. In other words, leave the roof and get out of town. Yeah. Right. The, uh, the rooftop was only accessible from the outside in those days, wasn't it, Lynn? So that's why he says not even go in. Yeah, don't even go, don't even go get your stuff. Just get yeah. out. And then he continues on, verse 16. And the one who's in his field must not turn back to get his coat, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it may not happen in the wintertime. For those days will be a time of tribulation. And that's where we get this idea of tribulation, such yeah. as has not occurred since the beginning of creation. So after the abomination of desolation in the temple, and this is all covered in that systematic theology teaching I, that I have for you, judgment breaks loose. And it's going to be a time of tribulation that is unlike any other time. But it's a time that I believe Christians do not experience. And I go into that in great detail in the in this in the scripture on the rapture in the link yeah. below. So I'm going to not worry about that today. Jesus is basically talking and saying, when, there are going to be signs that show this great tribulation is coming, and it's going to be starting in Jerusalem. So people in Judea need to, to get out of town because it's going, to be, it's going to be awful. Now, he continues on, and he says, now, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. Yeah. He's basically saying this tri this tribulation could have wiped everybody on the face of the earth, off the earth, <laughs> okay? Could have wiped them out. Yeah. But he says, God steps in and shortens those days for the sake of the elect. And I believe this is talking about people who become Christians during that tribulation period, mm -hmm. because people do respond to the gospel during that period. Yeah. 144,000 are there presenting the gospel to the Jews and to the nations, to the tribes. And people respond, and they are, they are responding to the gospel. And it says that if God hadn't shortened the days with his plan for the end times, all humanity would have been wiped off the face of the earth. Yeah. Says, but, he, but he stops it. In verse 21, and then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him. So during this tribulation period and during this time of trial, the end times, if somebody claims to be the Christ, that's not me. Yeah. He's really uh, referring to the Antichrist, isn't he, Lane? The Antichrist. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I mean, there are people alive today who claim to be a reincarnated Jesus. And we just got to not pay attention to them. Do yeah. not believe them. We we have that clearly in verse 21. Jesus flat out says in, in, in a command, do yeah. not believe him. There's, there's one Christ. And then he says in verse 22, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. In other words, there's going to be people yeah. who claim to be Christian. They said, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, but... Boy, this, this is really interesting what he's doing, and they're led astray. Now, I see that with, you know, the History Channel will have some weird teaching about yeah. Jesus. And I'll, yeah. hear, I'll hear Christians going, oh, that was really interesting. You know, maybe Jesus was a Hindu. And you go, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? that, that's just part of the end days. That's just part of false Christ. Yeah. And we, as the elect of, of God, as Christians... We need to be careful not to believe all this nonsense. Stick with sound doctrine, who Jesus is, and what he's done. And that's what he's basically talking about here. He's warning them. Yeah. False teachers, false Christs will come. And yeah. False prophets will come. 
Don't be led astray. I just thought about this. Since we don't know when Christ is coming back, do you think that Satan has an antichrist for every generation, so to speak? That no, uh, no, he's got he's got false teachers for every generation. Uh, if you go to the, to the book of First John, the Gospel of First John, it talks about false Christ, yeah, who who, um, who deny uh, who deny Jesus, yeah, and, and so every generation has people who are the false prophets who come in and uh, try to teach wrong doctrine. And they have false Christ in the people who claim to be Christ. But there's only one Antichrist. The, now, the Antichrist, what makes him as the, the Antichrist is he can do miracles. He can do yeah. wonders. That's Isn't right. He? He's, yeah. he's going he's gonna to be at the end time. Yeah. Uh, there, that one Antichrist. But I understand what you're saying is that every generation, including ours today, that, that has been waiting for the second coming has false Christ and false prophets to deal with. So yeah. the, the command Jesus is giving is basically to us today, just be ready and yeah. go after people that are claiming to be me Yeah, and don't follow them. In fact, the, in, in 23, there is a command for us today. Oh, yes. It says, Take heed. Yeah. Now, we have commands up in up earlier that we talked about last week, but I want to go through them real quick. These are warnings that Jesus gives. Listen to what it says. I've got a marked here in, in brown. See to it that yeah. no one misleads you. That's basically yeah. what Jesus is saying in chapter 13. Then it says down here in verse 7, do not be frightened. Uh, yeah. Christians shouldn't be frightened about the end times. We got nothing to be worried about. Jesus is in control. Yeah. Then verse 9 talks about be on your guard. Be on your guard. And yeah. Jesus is gonna he's gonna go there in verse in chapter 13 with the term be alert. And the gospel must be preached to everybody. So do not worry beforehand, just go about preaching the gospel. Now that's yeah. the last chapter. So he's basically saying the command is take heed. In other words, pay attention. Yeah. Now that's what this teaching is really for. It's basically saying God has got a plan. Things are going to be happening, and you can watch for those things. But the idea is take heed of what's going on around you. And he's going to continue that theme in a second. 24 says, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from he heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Shaken. This is at the end of that tribulation period. And at verse 26 says something very interesting. It says, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power. This is the actual second coming. The rapture, he, he doesn't come. He's not seen. He comes down and only comes to the clouds. He doesn't come all the way down to the earth. Right. And he, and he takes believers to heaven. And it's very interesting. It does not say then you will see the Son of Man coming. You notice yeah. that? Yeah, he says they. Yeah. and They will see. Because this is after the rapture. This is after the Christians are gone. Yeah. And then the second coming literally comes where Jesus is coming to judge. He says they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together all his elect from the four winds from the farthest ends of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Now, this is one of the verses that uh, some people say that, that, well, Jesus is saying that Christians are going to be through the end of the tribulation. Christians are going to go through the tribulation. I don't believe that's true. And I think there's a lot of other verses that clarify this. Basically, Jesus is reassuring that the elect are going to be collected. The, the elect are going to be taken care of. Yeah. Christians are going to be taken care of. Now, could that elect be those that are that have uh, accepted Christ during this uh, tribulation exactly. time? Exactly. That's what I personally believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they, their their bodies are going to be collected, and they're going to be uh, taken up into heaven, and that's going to be great, right? Yeah. Now, verse twenty eight. Let's finish out this these very quickly. Then he starts on this thing. But he goes back to the fig tree. Now, this is the third time. 
that the fig tree has been talked about in Jesus yeah. in Jesus the last week. It says, it says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branches have become tender and it's put forth its leaves, you will know that summer is near. Now that's where he's talked about that earlier on, that the, the fig tree has leaves and it looks good, but there's no fruit. Remember that? Mm -hmm. and, and God judges that. And God's going to judge the world because the fig tree has all these leaves, but there's no fruit. Okay. But when you see these leaves coming out and you see all this heresy and all this fruitlessness, you know it's the time of year when summer is, is happening. And then he goes, even so, so in, in light of the parable of the fig tree, when you see, not when yeah. they see, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, he's right at the door. So he's basically saying there are going to be signs for you to pay attention to and pay yeah. attention to the fruitlessness of religion and pay attention to the end times that it is the end. And we we're living in the end season. I believe that. Oh, yeah. Uh, because yeah. The signs are out there. And so when we see these things, we should recognize that he, the Messiah, is near. The second coming is close. It's, in fact, it's right at the door. It's going to happen. And he says, truly, I say, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And this generation, a generation is about a 40-year period. And basically, I believe it's talking about here that the generation that sees the rebuilding of the temple, the Antichrist coming to power, it's going to be 40 yeah. years. It's going to be a generation, approximately. Now, Jesus specifically is not giving us a timetable. And he's going to get no. into that. He says... I want you to recognize that the time is near and it's going to be close for that generation that sees this come to pass. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So I don't care when it is in history, even at the very end, these words about my second coming will stand. They don't change in 2021 and say, oh, well, these words don't mean the same thing in 2021 that they meant back when Jesus said them or even in the Old Testament when it was prophesied. Yes, his words will stand forever. They don't change. Yeah. You know, I've heard uh, growing up, pastors was uh, preaching then, you know, that Christ is coming. You know, uh, he's, he's coming soon. And then I've heard non-Christians say, well, you know, I've heard that all my life. But that still doesn't make it that less true that uh, he's still coming. And That's Right. And so you go, well, why would he... Why would he say it is so near when he knows it's going to be 2,000 years? Our concept of time is in minutes, seconds, days, and years. But he, uh, God doesn't have that standard. Uh, yeah, Jesus is going to make an interesting statement here in a second. I want to cover these very quickly. But he, he basically says, I don't even know the specific time. Yeah. Now he's talking about as the son, he has decided, you know, he's God, he knows everything. But as the son, he's part human and part God. Yeah. The human side of him does not know. Yeah. The human side of him wants us to be like, uh, he wants uh, to be an example to us. We, we don't know the details. All we know is it's going to happen. And the yeah. reason for that is this. Look what he says. But in verse 32, but yeah. of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, the angels. in heaven, nor the son. Now he says specifically, he doesn't say the he doesn't say me. He says the the son, the role of the son, the human side of the Godhead. He doesn't even know. Only the Father knows. It's it's God's plan, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. The command then, in light of that, and what Jesus has been talking about this whole thing is to get us to pay attention. And that's where he says in verse 33, the command, it's very strong. Take yeah. heed. Keep on the alert. The alert. Yeah. Now, he uses go, it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, if you go to the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the, the last chapter, about the middle of the chapter, Paul gives a list of five things, five actions that the Christian should be doing to live the Christian life. And <laughs> the, the first action is be alert. Yeah. Don't, don't fall asleep. Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't, don't drowse off. Be alert. And we, we have that exact same comment here. 
keep on the alert. Yeah. Because you he, don't know when the appointed time will come. Yeah, it's it's like uh, he repeats this uh, four times. I'm thinking five verses there. Yeah, you know? exactly. You, and it's, it's a like a sense of urgency, you know, a, a, a command that uh, I've learned that when you see uh, phases or words repeated that many times in that short distance, he really wants you to, he, the, the writer is trying to, uh, the Holy Spirit's trying to get your attention here to be alert, you know. And, and verse 32 to 37, the end of the chapter, really is the summation of what he's been talking about. Yeah. Uh, he, he's basically been saying, in light of all this stuff, I'm coming again. The second coming is coming. Yeah. And it's it's going to be judgment. So there are going to be signs for you to see. So be on the alert. This is, this is the actual purpose of what Jesus is teaching here. Like you said, look at what he says in verse 33. Keep on the alert. for You don't know yeah. the appointed time will come. You don't know when. So be alert. Verse 34. It is like a man away on a journey who, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. An alert. Basically, he yeah. said, hey, the, the boss is coming back, so I want you to stay by the door and watch for me. So stay yeah. alert. Verse 35, therefore, when we see the word therefore, we find out what it's there for. Well, but therefore is in light of all of chapter 13, be on the alert. You do not know yeah. when the master of the house is coming back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. During the whole night watch, be on the alert, no matter what time it is. Now, yeah. I, we can ask ourselves the question, Stan, is as Christians today, are we lulled into a sense of complacency about Jesus coming back, or are we on the alert? I believe I believe the, uh, a lot of Christians are complacency because we've heard he's coming for so long. So long, sure. Yeah, that we uh, we all have to have a, a had a tendency to be complacency. That you know, uh, well, part, part of this is the fault of. Some some teachers claim to be able to take these verses and other verses and say, I, I know when he's coming back. He's coming back, you know, in World War II, Hitler was the Antichrist, and Jesus yeah. was going to come back be before the end of, of the 1900s. And it just didn't happen. And we look at that and say, well, it didn't happen then. Well, it's because the teachers were teaching not what Jesus was talking about, but they were teaching their own opinion. And we got to be careful yeah. not to do that. What Jesus yeah. is specifically teaching is we got to be on the alert. We got to be watchful. Yeah, we got to be on alert 24 7. Yeah. And I, no. I really think that Christians fall into two main categories. Well, three actually. But the first one is they're worried about the end times, they're scared about the end times. And we saw yeah. earlier in chapter 13, Jesus said flat out, don't be frightened. The second category is a category who is. They, they basically say, like you said, it's been coming for so long, it's never going to get here. I don't have to worry about it. And they're complacent. Yeah. Okay? And they're basically disregarding Jesus' command to be on the alert. The third category are Christians who are on the alert, who understand that this, the Lord's coming back. And it's important that we tell people about Christ. Remember earlier in chapter 13, mm -hmm. one of the commands was, uh, until the world is reached. Yeah. So be sharing the gospel with people because the time is short. So yeah. if, we do, if we have family members and we say, well, we'll get around someday to sharing Christ with them, man, be on the alert and be, it's time is short. We need to be sharing with them now, yeah, not later and not being complacent. And I see that in this in the, he says in verse 36, in case he should come suddenly that the master and find you asleep. You know, if, if you were on watch as a Roman soldier and you, uh, the centurion would find you asleep, that was a death sentence. Yeah. So don't go to sleep. So as a Christian, I can say, hey, listen, am I taking this the Christian life seriously? Am I obeying Jesus here? That I'm taking heed that time is short, that he's coming again. And when he comes, he's not going to be fooling around. It's going to happen suddenly. And He's not trying to give us the details of when it's going to happen. He's trying to give us the understanding that 
we need to be ready whenever it happens. And that's really the point. Yeah. Be ready whenever it happens. Jesus is not trying to tell us it's going to happen in 2021. If it happens in 2021, I wouldn't be surprised. No. And I also wouldn't be, I wouldn't be uh, lacking faith if it didn't happen until 2040. It won. Yeah. It, I want to live prepared and I want to live alert right now. Exactly. In verse 37, we end with Jesus saying, what I say to you, I say to all. Now, he's talking to Christians and non-Christians. He's saying this to everybody. Yeah. You're a non-Christian. It's time for you to, to learn about Jesus and get alert that Jesus is coming again, and he's going to be serious. He's not going to be a jolly Santa Claus coming. He's going to be the judge coming, and it's time yeah. to take Jesus seriously now as Messiah and Lord in your life. And then he's also talking to us as Christians. Don't fall into that category that we're off in another world or we're worried about it. Don't fall into that category. Or the category of saying, it's never going to come. I don't have to worry about the second coming stuff. But be in that category of being on the alert. And I say to you, I say to yeah. all, be on the alert. And we can we can stop, share there, and, and say, am I being on the alert? Am I paying attention to what's happening in Israel? What am I... Am I praying for Israel? Am I praying for the times we live in this generation? There are Christians that like to, to rail about how terrible things are, but how much do they actually spend praying that it's it's the end times and I should be I should be on the alert and sharing the gospel, the good news of Christ, not just complaining about how bad things are. I should be sharing the good news of Christ with other people. Yeah. I wonder why Christians uh, kind of get panicky when they say, you know, when things start uh, are, are not going the way that we should be, uh, think no. they should be going like, you know, and we get upset, but Christ but it, lays it, it out. The scripture says clearly that Christians are going to suffer for the faith. Well, there are a lot of Christians who get real yeah. nervous about that. I, I don't want to suffer. I want everything to be great. I want I want, I want yeah. God's <laughs> blessings, but I don't want to suffer. And, and they become fearful that God might ask them to step out of their comfort zone, that God might ask them to actually suffer as a witness. Yeah. You know, when, when Bev got her cancer, there were people that said, hey, as Christians, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be getting cancer. We should be living a life of, of health. No, it gives us a great opportunity to show non-Christians this is how a Christian yeah. suffers. Yeah. We suffer yeah. believing and trusting and giving God glory. And if if that means dying, that's what it means. Yeah. If it means going through something that's hard, that's what it means. And Christians have no need to be fearful of that, but a lot of Christians are. And I think that's why a lot yeah. of Christians are afraid about that word tribulation, because they go, I don't, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to, you know, and I don't think they have to, but uh, they're worried about it. And Jesus specifically says, do not be frightened. And yet Christians disregard that and are frightened. So yeah. many of them are, not all. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it's just, you know, <clears throat> is it a lack of knowing what God says, you know, what he says in his word? You know, it's like the, the, the early church when, when Peter and, and James got beat up for, for talking about Jesus. They got beat up and they left praising God that they could suffer for the name of christ yeah yeah we ought to take that attitude that there may be trials or we may get people at work giving us a hard time about, about being christian we just need to praise god and just keep moving but stay yeah. alert Look. god's got a plan it's going to take place and we just need to surrender and be watchful and be active in our lives and our christian lives because of it amen, amen. yeah well listen that finishes up chapter 13 and chapter 14. We're going to start next week. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope if, if you want more details, go to those links down in the description below. And uh, I hope God blesses you with those details. And you can get that free workbook with a lot of information in that about a lot of doctrine. Uh, that's available to you. And I appreciate your time, Stan, going through this Bible study today. I enjoyed it, man. It's, it's good. good. 
an interesting <clears throat> teaching, an interesting time, and an end yes. teaching Tuesday. So now we're going to see yeah. what does Jesus do on Wednesday, the last Wednesday he's alive, and yeah. we're going to see that when we come back next time. In the meantime, God bless you. We'll see you then.